recall that when you visit a URL like http colon slash slash www.example.com, you're actually requesting of some web server a file, most likely, called, for instance, index.html. Now, to be fair, that file can be called something else, and it doesn't actually have to be a file. It can be a program that generates a response for the user. But in the common case, it's indeed a file called index.html, even if you or some user has not. Explicitly typed it. And what that means is that you're effectively downloading from the server just a file that happens to be a text file, such as one written in notepad.exe or text edit on a Mac. But this file is written in such a way that the browser understands it. It's written in a language called itself HTML or hypertext. Markup language. And now, this is indeed not a programming language, but a markup language, a set of instructions that tells the computer what to do and how to do it, but not in the way that we saw with programming languages proper. We don't have an HTML functions or loops or conditions or variables. Rather, we have what we're going to call tags, special instructions to the browser that tell it what to start doing and eventually. What to stop doing. So, for instance, if you might want to display text or center that text or format it or structure it in some way, HTML is going to allow us to present contents of a web page. And eventually, we'll see another language via which we can style the same, but we're not going to do it in the same way as logically as we did with the programming language. So, what might the simplest possible web page be that we could implement in this language called HTML? Well, consider this web page here. In the main part of the page, do I see hello body, a sort of greeting to the actual user? And up here in the title, do I see quite simply hello title, referring to the title bar or the tab atop this web page? Now, it's incredibly simple. It's only white space everywhere else. So, this web page would seem to have just a couple of phrases. So, how using this language, HTML, would you go about implementing this page? Well, let's take a look. Here I have just a simple text editor again, similar in spirit to Notepad or TextEdit. I'm going to call this file index.html simply to be consistent with that URL we saw. Now, what might the contents of this file be? Well, to write the simplest possible web page, I'm simply going to begin as follows open bracket or a less than sign, followed by an exclamation point, and then doc type. HTML, a fairly arcane line of text that is simply a clue to the browser to say, hey, browser, here comes a web page written in a version of HTML. Version 5. Indeed, this first line of code has changed over the years. This is perhaps the simplest yet, and it implies only implicitly that indeed we want to use HTML5. Now, thereafter, actually come the structure of the web page itself. And so I will literally type this open bracket, HTML, close bracket. And then a couple of lines later, let me go ahead and say open bracket, slash, HTML. These are what are called tags. And they say to the browser, hey, browser, here comes a page written in HTML. And hey, browser, that's it for this web page. So whereas we might call this first tag here the start tag and this last tag the end tag, we might also call them the open and close tag, respectively, thereby implying that there's a structure and a, a symmetry, really, to a web page whereby you both start and stop ultimately a thought. Now, inside of this web page, you're going to be at least two parts, just as we saw in the rendering. Thereof in the browser. We have what we're going to call the head of the web page, the very topmost portion thereof. And I'm going to go ahead and preemptively say open bracket head close bracket, and then again close that tag by using a forward slash in front of that very same name. Now, for now, the only thing that can go in the head of a web page for our purposes, it turns out, is something like the page's title. And I'll go ahead and say title, and just as before, Hello, title. Now that's the end of my thought, and so I'm going to tell the browser that is it for the title, and I'm going to close or end that tag, so to speak. So that covers it for the top part of the page. What about the rest of it, the body of the page? Well, there too, I have another tag, quite simply called body, that says, hey, browser, here comes the body of my page, the remainder of the contents that really fill out the rest. Thereafter, I'm going to preemptively say, all right, that's going to be it for the body, but inside of that body are going to be the contents there. Of. Perhaps just a phrase like I had before, or perhaps a picture or video, or much more. This is where you would put the contents of a company's web page or anything that you want to present to the user. I'm quite simply for now going to say hello body, and that's it. Hereafter, I'll save this file, and it will exist on my hard drive as just that a file called index.html. And if I now go into my browser and choose File Open or simply drag that file index.html onto the browser, what I will see. Is just this. A browser picture here is Chrome, and in the title bar is indeed Hello Title, and in the body is just that 
hello body. The browser knows what to do. Because indeed, at the end of the day, all a browser does is that it reads this language called HTML in a file called typically something.html, top to bottom, left to right. And every time it encounters one of these tags, It does what that tag means. So, Google and Microsoft and Mozilla and others who create these so called browsers simply design them in such a way that they know how to, if you will, interpret HTML. Again, it's not a programming language or interpreted in quite the same way that Python is, but it is, in fact, an interpreted line by line, top to bottom, left to right, and the browser simply does. What these tags tell it to do present the title up here and the body down here. Now, fortunately, there are many more tags than just these, whereby we can create lists and tables and paragraphs and more. And so let's flesh out the vocabulary, so to speak, that is HTML by looking at some more complicated examples. Here, for instance, is a file called paragraphs.html. And I've begun it just as I have before with a doc type HTML at the top, an HTML tag thereafter, and a close HTML tag down below. A head, a close head, an open body, a close body, a title tag, and a close title tag thereafter. But between that, I've gone ahead and whipped up a couple of paragraphs of Latin, or, well, Latin. Thereby filling out the screen much more. But let's go ahead and now open this file in a browser and we'll see that it doesn't quite present in the way that you'd think. Indeed, when I open this file in my browser, all I see is just one big block of text, no two paragraphs, even though when I typed it out, did I very deliberately hit my Enter key a couple of times in order to create that break between paragraphs. And so, what's going on then? Why is the browser ignoring me? Well, indeed, just as with the tags, a browser only does what it tells you to do. And in fact, by default, it ignores white space, presses of your spacebar or tab key that are typically used only in writing code. Code to make the code more readable for the user, whether Python or HTML or anything else. And indeed, notice how I very nicely indented here everything on the screen, including those paragraphs. But I don't want to see all of this space in the page, and I don't want to see all of this space in the title or body. And so the browser just ignores seemingly superfluous white space, simply presuming that the code itself was pretty printed. But that's, of course, a problem when what I want to display is text, English text, that actually has paragraphs and structure. And so I need to format this a little bit differently. I need to tell the browser, hey, browser, break lines here so as to move the text down below. So let's go ahead and do that. And let me go in here between these two paragraphs and type out a open bracket br close bracket, indicating line break. Indeed, here br is obviously not a complete word. It's just an abbreviation because HTML ultimately tends to optimize characters. And for any type of tag, so to speak, that you might use frequently, it tends to have a shorter name or nickname like this. Now, curiously about br, That's it. I'm done typing. Because with a line break, it's either there or it's not there. You can't really start breaking a line and then stop breaking a line. You either do it or you don't. And so the BR tag, unlike HTML head, title, and body, does not in fact have a corresponding end tag. You could theoretically go ahead and say open bracket slash BR close bracket, but it has no meaning and you shouldn't put anything in between anyway. And so it's not strictly necessary, and HTML5 allows you to. Omit that altogether. Or if you really do like to feel symmetric, can you put the forward slash inside the tag right there at the end? So, here too, the language itself, HTML, allows for all of these possibilities. But why type more characters when you can type fewer? And so we'll leave it, for instance, as just this. Let me go ahead and save now the file and reload the browser, and you'll see that. It doesn't seem to have quite solved the problem. Now, it did make sure that that first paragraph ends and the next one begins here, but I don't see the space that I'd like to see, as in a magazine or paper or book, whereby those two paragraphs are truly distinct. So, how can I do better? Well, if one BR tag got me one break, why not use two to get two? And so, let's do that in my code instead, this time doing open bracket BR close bracket again, telling the browser, give me two line breaks here. And if I now reload that page in my browser, I do in fact see a gap. Between paragraphs. But this feels a little bit hackish and, and frankly old school, akin to a typewriter, where the only expressiveness you have is what you can do mechanically. But these days in software, we should certainly 
be able to do more. And so indeed, HTML accommodates this. Rather than just break lines, why not tell the browser, hey, browser, here is a paragraph, and say that a couple of times for a couple of paragraphs. So let me go back into my code here. And instead of this line break, instead, first go to the start of my text and say, hey, browser, here comes a paragraph abbreviated. Just P. And just for consistency, I'll go ahead and indent the rest of that paragraph. And notice my text editor is smart and it's moving everything over just so that I can see that this is all part of one thought, if you will. It's not actually adding all of these spaces to the actual output. But when that paragraph is done, I should tell the browser as much and do open bracket slash P, close bracket, thereby saying, hey, browser, that's it. For this paragraph. But I again want to say this a second time. And so here on my second line, will I go ahead and say open bracket P close bracket? And then below that paragraph of text, go back down and finish that thought as well. And so it's a bit more verbose now because I have to say both start and stop or open and close. But now I've told the browser all the more explicitly what instructions to follow. And if I go back into my browser and reload now, we'll see that I indeed still have that gap between lines. But I no longer have to fairly hackishly, if you will, hit line break, line break just twice. So that's how I get paragraphs. How about a list, whether a to do list for the day or a whole list of thoughts? Well, here I've readied a page called list.html. And as before, I've structured it in the usual way doc type up top and then HTML at the top, close HTML at the bottom with a head and a body in between, and only a title. So let's now focus on making a list inside of that body. And suppose that I have three thoughts on my mind. Foobar and Baz, the go to words for any computer scientist, not unlike X, Y, or Z for a mathematician. So if I have three things to say, I might go ahead and say foo, bar, and Baz, one per line, just as you might on a tablet or on an actual piece of paper. And let me go ahead and save this now and open it in my browser. And unfortunately, just as you might expect, per our foray into paragraphs, each of those thoughts ends up. On that same line. Well, why is that? Well, I haven't told the browser to give me separate paragraphs, let alone lines. And indeed, these really aren't paragraphs now. I want for myself a, a proper list. Well, it turns out that HTML does offer that in the form of multiple types of lists. And in fact, if I go back to my code and I'm a bit more explicit this time, I can say, hey, browser, give me a list, specifically a UL or unordered list, one that will not have numbers. And then beneath that, I'm going to go ahead and indent my previous thoughts, but this time I'm I'm going to surround them with open bracket li for list item and then open bracket close li for the same. Then each of the elements below will get that same wrapper, if you will open bracket li and then open bracket close li. And then lastly, so does get baz. Of course, I need to finish that whole thought and say, hey, browser, that's it for my unordered list. If I now save this and go back to my browser and reload, What I'll get is that unordered list, complete with bullets given to me by the browser. And here now, do I have the ability to start formatting a page in a fairly standard way without having to worry about how do I get the bullets and where do I put them? The browser. Can do that for me. Now, to be fair, it's up to the particular browser how to render that unordered list, and different browsers, Chrome or Firefox or Edge, might interpret that UL tag differently. But for the most part, we humans have agreed universally what these bullets should look like. But what if I want this list to actually be ordered and not unordered? Well, instead, I can actually use OL instead of UL, thereby giving me an ordered list. Here, I need only change that U to an O and this U to an O as well, hitting save, not even adding any numbers myself. And if now I go back to my page and reload, I automatically, for free, so to speak, get my one, two, and three. And you can imagine then the utility of this, not so much for foos, bars, and bazes, but rather when these lists get long. You, as the developer of the web page, no longer need to worry about keeping track of these numbers, let alone if some additional element needs to be inserted at the beginning or middle or end of that list. You don't have to worry about renumbering that page. After all, computers can save us time and solve problems for us, and this is just one with which we're scratching the surface.
OK, well, that ends the list. Suppose I want to start writing whole chapters or sections or subsections thereof. Well, it turns out HTML can help me with that too, because up until now, we've seen no mention of font size or font weight, bold or italics or the like. And it turns out we can nonetheless get some of those features via HTML itself. Within the body of this page, for instance, suppose I have the first chapter of my book. Well, I can go ahead and say open bracket h1 for heading one, the first top. Most level, and then I'll simply say for now something like one. I'll go ahead and close that tag with open bracket slash h1 close bracket, and then let's move on to the next. Suppose that within chapter one there's a section, and so it is diminutive with respect to the first. And so here I'm going to say not h1, but h2, thereafter saying a word like to itself, open bracket slash h2 close bracket. And if we continue this logic doing h3, followed by three, and close bracket h3, and h4, followed by four, and close h4, and then open bracket h5, five, followed by close five, and then lastly h6. Followed by six, and then we can complete that thought as well. And that's as many levels as you get. Beyond that, you better start reorganizing your book. I'm going to go ahead now and save this file and open it in my browser. And what do I get? Well, I get a whole hierarchy. At the very top is one in the biggest, boldest text that we see. Beneath that is still some text that's bold, but smaller still. And it repeatedly does the font progressively get smaller, but still bold faced, thereby drawing attention to it, just as you might. In a book. So HTML does all of that for free, and we can commingle these tags so that I have paragraphs of text, but above and below them, these section headings, h1 through h6. Now, web pages are so much more than just text, so much more than headings and lists. They're ultimately, frankly, about links, hyperlinks from one page to another. So, how with HTML can we go about linking one page to another? Well, again, with these tags. Here is a file called link.html, and it too has our, our boilerplate code a head, HTML tag, a head, and a title, as well as a body where our Code need now go. So within that body, let's go ahead and encourage people to visit Harvard, Harvard's website. And I'll proceed to say visit https colon slash slash www.harvard.edu. Now, my text editor here is being quite friendly. It's actually underlining it for me as though it's just a link. But browsers are not so friendly as these text editors that developers use. And indeed, if I save this file now, go into my browser, and open this file. What I see is literally what I typed. Visit https colon slash slash www.harvard.edu. And yet it's not underlined here. And indeed, I can try clicking this all day long, highlighting it too. Nothing actually happens. And that's because the browser has taken me literally. All it saw in my file was visit https colon slash slash www.harvard.edu. I never actually told it. To link to that page. So if I go back to my code, I need to be more explicit, it seems. And indeed, there's a tag for just this. Historically, it's called the anchor tag, or short just A. So open bracket A. And now I need to tell the browser where to take the user. And albeit redundantly, let me first type href for hyper reference equals quote unquote. That URL. And now I have the opportunity to tell the browser what to display to the user. So rather than say the URL, I'm going to say the more user friendly Harvard, followed by open bracket slash A close bracket period. And at this point, notice the slight asymmetry. Whereas I've opened the tag with A, href, I've closed the tag with just A. Indeed, whenever you have a tag, Whose behavior needs to be customized in this way. The behavior of the tag influenced by an additional input, otherwise known as an attribute, of which href is just one. What you do in closing the tag is only mention with that one forward slash the name of the tag, not the attribute. Otherwise, you'd be repeating yourself. All day long. And indeed, this is indeed more generally an attribute, a key word defined in the HTML language that somehow modifies the behavior of the tag inside which you've typed it. And it's structured typically as some keyword like href followed by equals and then a pair of quotes, maybe single or double. And inside of that is some value. So here too, we see a theme we've seen in other contexts and languages. Key value pairs, some word associated with some value. And this one, as we'll soon see, will modify the behavior of the anchor or a tag to actually 
create a link like the one we see here. And so if I go ahead and save this file and go back to the same page in my browser and click reload, what I now see is that visit Harvard, this time underlined and in that. Familiar blue. And indeed, if I hover over this link, albeit small, you'll see a little clue in the bottom left of your screen, at least if using Chrome, that tells you preemptively where, if you click that, you'll actually end up. Of course, there's a bit of a, a threat here, I dare say. Whereas I might say one thing, I might actually mean another. And in fact, I could, for instance, were I a, a rival, go into this code and instead say, oh, please visit Yale, saving the file thereafter and reloading. And here I see now a message to visit Yale. But of course, if I hover over that, it's really just an invitation to visit www.harvard.edu. Well, this, this, this is just playful. We could actually be more malicious than this. And indeed, if you flip through someday your spam folder, odds are you'll find some message you've not ever seen that actually does have hyperlinks, because these days, emails can be written by computers or humans in. HTML and display it as web pages within your browser. But within your spam folder might very well be what's called a phishing attack, an attack by someone who is trying to socially engineer you into clicking one link that you think goes someplace, but actually goes someplace else. For instance, I might here say, you know what, go ahead and visit paypal.com, thereby inviting you to visit this page. And if I now reload, And look at what's here. I'm invited to visit paypal.com. And yet, if I click that, I'm clearly going to end up at www.harvard.edu. Well, that isn't necessarily all that malicious, but were that URL not to be www.harvard.edu, but some domain name some bad actor has bought, trying to trick you into giving him or her your username or password or credit card information or something even more personal, it truly is not all that hard with these. Basic primitives. This is how HTML works, and phishing attacks are derivative of exactly this design. So, what do you do? Well, you could certainly adopt a habit of hovering over links and realizing,、mm -mm, I'm not actually going to paypal.com. Most of us probably won't be so paranoid as to do that regularly. But with antivirus software and tools that are cloud based, can we detect some of this automatically? And indeed, browsers like Chrome will occasionally, if they know, Through experience, some website to be bad might even warn you within that window. And corporate networks as well can certainly do this, albeit at the cost, computationally and in terms of your privacy, of monitoring all of the emails and traffic going in and out of a network, thereby being capable of alerting users if they see something dangerous. But it all boils down to these basic, simple tags. And indeed, this was just the first example of using an attribute to modify the behavior of some tag. It turns out there are others that you can use more for good and not evil. And indeed, on the HTML tag itself, it's not uncommon to specify a language. For instance, this one here. Your browser might be in the habit, if you visit some foreign website, of asking you, would you like to translate this page from its native language into English? And one of the clues you can provide to a browser is exactly that. Hey, browser, Browser, here comes a web page written in HTML specifically with English text or any other, thereby helping those automatic translation tools know, to know what it is they're looking at so as to translate with higher probability of success it to some other language. Now, web pages are so much more than just text. They have images and sounds and videos and more. So, how can we go about embedding media in a web page? Well, it's again thanks to these tags and attributes. Here, for instance, is a file called image.html. I've begun as I always have with doc type and HTML, head and body, and therein. A title. And this time I've proactively said the language of this web page and any other is going to be written in my own English. And now suppose that I have on my, my hard drive here an image called cat.jpg. And I want to embed that image in my web page. How do I do it? Well, I'm going to go ahead and this time start with an open bracket IMG, which is short for image, and then specify that the source of the image I want is going to be SRC for source equals quote unquote cat. JPEG. Thereafter, I'm going to go ahead and close my tag and save this file and go ahead now and open it up. And we'll see here exactly that a cat, a grumpy cat, in fact. And the browser has done exactly what I've told. I've said, hey, browser, here comes an image, the source of which should be this file called cat.jpg. And it does exactly that, embedding it 
as the very first thing it sees. Now, this is not nearly as accessible as it might be in multiple ways. One, if I'm on a slow internet connection, the human might not see this image all too soon as his or her phone or, or browser downloads it slowly. And it'd be nice to have some placeholder text. Moreover, for accessibility's sake, if I'd like to ensure that users who are blind and require screen readers can actually have this image recited or described to them, have an actual hint in the code with which to describe it. Verbally. So, how might I do this? Well, in HTML, you can have multiple attributes, not just zero or one, but a second one too. For instance, alt, the alternative text for this image shall be, for instance, one grumpy cat. And if now I were to reload this page on a slow connection, would I see that text or, if using a screen reader, have it recited to me? Now, how about data with even more structure? Something tabular with rows and columns and numbers and names? Well, here too, HTML provides us a mechanism. And in fact, this one I'll cook in advance. In this file, do we have table.html, some of our familiar structure, but also some new tags. Indeed, in the body of this page, do we have a new one called table? Open bracket, table, close bracket, which just says, hey, browser, here comes some tabular info. And below that, do we have a, a less obviously named tr tag that says, hey, browser, here comes a table row. Within that table row tag, which is only later closed, do we have three TD tags, it would seem, one, two, and three. Well, TD stands for table data and denotes here comes a column or cell, the actual data in this position. And the close tag, of course, means that's it for that data. One, two, and three, followed by four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, each of them in their own table rows. What sort of effect might that have in the end? One, two, three in one row, four, five, six in another, seven, eight, nine. And if we scroll further, it turns out an asterisk, a zero, and hash. What have I laid out in tabular form? Well, you might not see it so often if you're using your contacts, but on a typical phone, this is exactly how those numbers and symbols are laid out, really in rows and columns. And if I go now and open up this file in my browser, well, I see that, albeit fairly small, laid out top to bottom, left to right. Indeed, here in table.html, once viewed with a browser, do I see my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and asterisk, 0, and hash. So you can certainly imagine longer words or phrases, dollar amounts, or any data being laid out in this way, even taking up the entire width of the screen, otherwise known as the viewport. Now, to add one last piece of jargon here, even though these tags, open and close, are each called just that. Collectively, what we have on the screen here are any number of HTML elements. An HTML element is a higher level concept, such as you might see in a data structure in memory, that represents everything between this start tag and end tag and everything within. In fact, what we keep looking at here in, in HTML form is really a, a tree of some sort. In fact, it's no accident that I've been deliberately indenting every level of my code here so that the browser knows what's inside of something else. Now, to be fair, I could delete almost all of the white space, all of the tabs and spacebar characters that I've typed thus far, because again, the browser doesn't care. This is mostly for your benefit and mine, so as to read our own code top to bottom, left to right, and see it quite quickly. But it turns out that the computer when reading this code top to bottom, left to right, actually loads it into its own memory or RAM in a tree-like form. After all, at the very top of this file is this one very important tag. Hey, browser, here comes a web page in HTML. And then nested inside of that, slightly indented, is both head and the body. Much like in a tree structure, might a node have one or two children. Meanwhile, within body, do you have another child table inside of which is one, two, three, four table rows, four total children. And within just one of those children, say this table row, are three children as well. So akin to a, a real world family tree, do we have a number of root elements, so to speak, each of which have children of some number, at below which might be grandchildren and more. So how might we see this? Well, this is generally known as a DOM, document object model. And HTML would have us think of it as just this. This then is the simplest of web pages with which we began, whereby we had hello title, hello body. 
plus this time lang equals English. But on the right here, do we have an artist's rendition of what a computer would do when that browser reads this HTML file top to bottom, left to right? Well, at the very top of this tree, we'll just call it the generic document, some sort of reference to everything inside. But the one and one only children that we've seen thus far beneath that is that HTML element, which itself has two children head on the left and body on the right. Meanwhile, that head element indented inside of that was. Title, and so we see title as its sole child, and inside of that was not another tag or element, but rather just text, a text node in this tree, and that's why I've drawn it in its very different shape to make clear that it's not an element that has some notion of starting and ending, but rather it's just the value effectively of that particular node. And down here in the body, did we only have a short phrase, hello body, and it too was a, a leaf, so to speak. Of this tree. And here then we see the intersection of the human and computer in our discussion itself of, of data structures. Here is the computer using a fundamental core concept of CS while allowing the human, or really the computer, to think at a higher level of abstraction. It does not matter how this is represented in memory, but that it is. Represented and can be. And so here, via this indentation, do we see a hint at what the computer is ultimately doing? Now, finally, what about user input? Suppose that you want your web page to interact with the user and actually ask them for some textual input like a, a web form might. Well, consider this file here, search.html, which I've again begun as always, and I'm now ready for the body of this page. Well, it turns out that HTML also indeed supports forms, such as any of those text boxes or check boxes or drop down menus that you might see on a typical web page. And this tag for this is quite simply open bracket, Form close bracket, and I'll go ahead now and preemptively finish that thought. And it turns out that within form tags, can you have so called inputs, each of which can be of some disparate type? For instance, here I'll go ahead and say input, the type of which shall be text. And then hereafter, I'll go ahead and have another input, input type equals submit, thereby giving me, per HTML's own documentation, Inputs, that is UI mechanisms via which the user can provide textual input and then submit it to some server. Let's go ahead and save this file and open it in my browser. And what I see now is quite simply this a text box that just seems to be waiting for input, followed by a submit button that will submit it. To some server. Now we can clean this up a little bit because I don't really know what I'm looking at. And so let me go back to my code and put a placeholder in this text box, literally adding another attribute that says, for instance, query, whatever it is the user wants to search for. Meanwhile, let me change the value of that button to actually say not the default submit, but for instance, more clearly, search. And now if I reload this page, it's a bit more self explanatory to the user. It's not just an empty box, but one that says query, and that button explicitly. Says search. And if I begin now to type in this box, query will go away if I want to search for, say, cats. Of course, if I click search now, what's be going to become of this input? Well, nothing because I have no back end server, let alone database. But you know what? I know who does Google, and Google's very good at searching the web. So let's see if I can't glean via HTTP how Google itself works and see if I could make my own front end, that is, web page for Google, but defer all of the logic to Google's own back end. Well, let's see exactly what happens when I search Google for cats. Here we go, enter, and while I'm whisked away to any number of cats, more than Four billion indeed. But let's focus not so much on the actual results, but on how we got them. Indeed, if I focus on the URL up here, you'll see that this URL itself begins with the familiar https colon slash slash www.google.com slash search, a, a program of sorts on Google servers that does literally that search the web. Then there's this question mark followed by a number of other words and key phrases and a number of equal signs. And if I keep looking, Ampersands. It turns out that HTT specifies not only how web browsers and servers communicate within that so called virtual envelope, but also how the browser should format the user's input when submitting it to some server. And in fact, there's so much up here that I don't understand at first glance. I'm going to just start deleting things from that URL that just seem unfamiliar. But familiar, of course, after I delete just a few characters, is Q equals cats, which would seem to relate to whatever I typed in. In fact, let me go ahead and erase everything after that is irrelevant, hit enter again, and search much more simply. And I still get 
those cats. Well, what does that mean? Well, it seems that HTTP prescribes that in order to provide input from browser to server, you literally visit some URL. You append to that URL a question mark, thereby saying, hey, server, here come some inputs. And those inputs have names, for instance, Q, followed by an equal sign, and then whatever the human typed in. And if the human had typed into multiple boxes or maybe checked some checkboxes or selected from menus, well, those additional inputs or HTTP parameters would all appear in that URL separated by ampersands, each of them a key value pair separated. With equals. Well, that's all I've searched for here. And you know what? I bet I could mimic this behavior. I know the URL to which I want to send the user's input, and I can defer to the browser to format that input. It remains then only to somehow wire this logic into my web page. So let's go back to that web page and finish our form's thought. The action I would like this form to take, so to speak, is to submit specifically to https colon slash slash www.google.com slash search, the URL of that program running on Google servers that does quite simply search. I don't need to type a question mark Q or an equal sign, and I certainly don't want to type cats. That should come from the user. But I do need to give the user's input a name, which I'll do here with now a third Attribute, the name equaling Q. Why Q? Well, that's clearly what Google decided. And it turns out some 20 years ago, so did Larry and Sergey at Google in its infancy decide that the name of their query parameter would simply be Q. My other input doesn't need a name per se, because it's just a button that needs to trigger that submission. And so now, if I save this file and go back to my own browser and reload, I still see the same form here, a query. With a button, but if I now go ahead and, for instance, search for cats and hit search, indeed the URL to which I whisk my users away is just that Q equals cats. Now, to be clear, cats are not hard coded in this page. If I go back to my own and this time search for, say, dogs, I can go ahead and search for those two. My browser will presume to append dogs after that equal sign, thereby allowing me to search dynamically. For anything I want. Now, there's a few other features here that relate really to UX, user experience. In this form, now that I've searched for a couple of things, you'll notice that the browser wants to complete that thought for me using what's generally known as autocomplete, a browser specific feature sometimes that remembers the words you've typed into some box and then reminds you of such just to save you keystrokes. Now, you might not want this to happen. You, the web page, might want to implement this sort of feature yourself. And so we can actually turn off that notion of autocomplete. Moreover, if I visit this web page, the very first thing I have to do, it would seem, is actually click in that box. I can't actually type until I have. Focus on that input. And this too is not all that good for user experience. Why make me, if I already come to your website to search, the first thing I need to do is actually click in that box? Why not click on it for me yourself with code? And we can do this with HTML. Indeed, if I go back to this input here and I say, you know what, go ahead and turn auto complete quote unquote off, as well as auto focus. On that particular box. Now, here we see already an anomaly. In HTML5, attributes don't have to have values per se. They need not be followed by an equal sign or double or single quotes. You can just specify the attribute's name. And if it's present, it means give focus automatically to this text input. And if it's not present, just don't do that feature. Now, indeed, if I go back to my browser and reload, What you see now is even with my cursor away from that box, does it already have focus? And on Mac OS here, does it tend to highlight in blue? But other operating systems and browsers might do it a bit differently. But the key is I can search for immediately without clicking anything I want, without now this time even being prompted for my last input, cats or say dogs. Now, thus far, our web pages have been fairly simplistic, but there are so many more tags we can use. But those tags all follow a, a similar format a tag's name followed by zero or more attributes. But some of those tags have more meaning than others. And can we begin now to stylize our page further through fonts and through colors and more? Consider, for instance, this. Homepage here for John Harvard. Welcome to my homepage, copyright John Harvard. How might we go about structuring this page with HTML? We'll consider this, this file here. 
which I've written already. Here in this file, do I have really three paragraphs, one on top of the other? And within those paragraphs, do I have text? Now, one anomaly that we've not yet seen is that copyright. I'm not sure where on my keyboard to type a, a C within that circle, but it's indeed a symbol that computers and printers can express. And within HTML, indeed, can you express those same characters, even if they're not readily accessible on your own keyboard? This thing here, ampersand hash 169 semicolon, is what's known as an HTML entity. That ampersand says, hey, browser, here comes an entity, number 169. And that semicolon means that's it for that. Now, within the computer's memory is a list, essentially, of all of these codes that correspond to the symbol, the punctuation that you want to display. And so here do we get in the actual browser the graphical version thereof. But these aren't, strictly speaking, paragraphs per se. Indeed, these are really just different divisions of the page. And so there are other tags in HTML like exactly that, div, whereby you can fairly generically say, here comes a division of my page, really an invisible rectangle, a swath from left to right across the screen that represents this information, then this than this. Of course, that doesn't really have much meaning unto itself either. And so in HTML5, the latest version, are there more semantically meaningful tags? For instance, this feels like perhaps the header of my page, and perhaps this is the main aspect thereof. Meanwhile, this copyright might be relegated to the simple idea of a, a footer. And so HTML also has tags like those there. I can actually call this not the head, but the proper header of my page, and I'll close that tag there. Here might be the main part of my page, and so I'll call it just that. And then down here will be the footer of my page, which I'll specify as such. And now I further refine the semantics of my web page, which does not change at all the layout, but it does help the browser, perhaps, both now and in the future, better understand what it is it's looking at. And indeed, for SEO, search engine optimization, the more hints you can provide to the Googles and Bings of the world, the more they can know what it is they're searching and how to index it. Moreover, they know perhaps what to display in search results if the main part of the page is this and everything else is just header and footer. So the more hints you can provide to the browser and in turn web is probably a good thing for your own website. But of course, if I reload this same HTML now, it's going to look exactly the same. But with these tags, as well as with div and with p, I can actually begin now to stylize my website more. But I can't rely on HTML alone, at least not with HTML5. I need a, a second new language. And indeed, HTML works wonderfully well in conjunction with a second language called CSS. Cascading style sheets, which allows you to take a website that last mile and get the aesthetics, the colors, the fonts, and the positioning just right, leaving less to the browser to just infer. And with CSS, though, we need to somehow remain within the confines of our HTML, at least for now. And so, how might I provide yet another language? Well, these attributes of HTML provide one solution. For instance, suppose I want to specify that the style of my header shall have a very large font size. I can indeed say font size colon large. And here on the main part of my page, well, I'm fine with the style thereof of being font size medium. Meanwhile, the footer is sort of my last thought, and so I'll style it ever so smaller with a font size colon small. Now, what is this then that I've just typed? Well, this is CSS within the confines of my HTML attributes values surrounded by quotes. Have I specified CSS syntax, which follows this pattern, some keyword like font size followed by colon followed by that so-called properties value. And indeed here, the property I'm using throughout this page now is font size, but with three different values, large, medium, and small. Predetermined words that every browser should just know, even though they're more relative than they are fixed. And so let's go now and save this file and reload the page. And now I'll have the same content, but stylized differently still. Indeed, when I reload the page now, I still have three lines of text, three paragraphs or divs or now sections, if you will. But John Harbert's text is indeed a bit larger, and my welcome to home page is just medium. Meanwhile, copyright John Harbert is ever so smaller because I've now applied styles 
to each of these sections. But it'd be nice if this, after all, is John Harbert's homepage. Let's greet everyone right in the middle and align that text in the center. Well, how might we do that? Well, it turns out that with CSS, you can specify one or more properties within each of these. Pairs of quotes, simply separating them with a semicolon, thereby finishing the first thought and starting another. And so I might now say something like text align colon center, and then down here do the same text align colon center, and then lastly here the same text align colon center. If I now save this file, reload the page, what I see now is exactly that same text, but now nicely centered. And so now, do I have, through this combination of HTML and CSS, a wonderful marriage of structure and style, each of them focused on really particular tasks? But there's some redundancy. And indeed, anytime you find yourself doing the same thing again and again, like text align center, text align center, text align center, you're probably doing something wrong. Surely there's an opportunity here to factor that out and somehow say that thought just once and apply it throughout. And indeed, here's one hint at what we mean by cascading style sheets. That first C implies that you can have one property sort of affect multiple things in your tree. That so called DOM. After all, with header and main and footer, notice that they all share a common parent. So, to speak, in the family tree sense. That parent here is body. And if I want everything centered but disparate font sizes for each of those sections, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just remove each of those text aligned centers and move all three of those to just one on the parent, saying, hey, browser, the style of its body should instead be. Text align center. If I now save this page and reload, voila, it actually still looks the same because the effect is the same. But now I've been more succinct. I've typed fewer keystrokes, thereby saving time. And I've also ensured now that design wise of my code, if I need ever change that value, say to left or to right, I can only change it now in one place and affect everything. But there's still an opportunity to design this code better. Up until now, I've been co mingling one language with another, mixing in my CSS properties inside those quotes inside of HTML proper. Now, it turns out in industry, this isn't always best practice to have one language right there in another, if only because if I'm working with some colleague who's focused on the site's aesthetics, the UI designer, whereas I'm the web developer focusing on structure, it would be nice if the two of us could work independently but collaboratively. But it's hard to imagine how. How that w o r k well if his or her code needs to be commingled with mine. So it tends to be better practice to actually factor out one language, say CSS, and remove it from those attributes and put it, for instance, in a tag of its own. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. In fact, increasingly in web development, there is this notion of components, whereby one human doesn't work on just one page, but some portion thereof, a component like just the search box or some other feature. And in those cases, are we actually seeing an industry? A tendency in the opposite direction, whereby he or her, she combines their HTML and CSS into one. But for this process, whereby I'm creating not components but web pages, probably shouldn't be commingling them there. So indeed, I'm going to go into this same code, remove those style attributes, and instead go back to the head of my page, where historically I've had nothing else but my title, and now go in and add a style tag. Not attribute, opening and closing it within the confines of that head. And inside of this style tag, can I now go ahead and type CSS? I'll indent it as always just for beauty's sake. But here I can go ahead and specify well, what tags in my HTML should have what properties? And I can do this by name. For instance, the body of my web page shall have, as per these curly braces, the following property well, text align. Colon center. Meanwhile, the header of my page, not to be confused with the head, shall instead have font size colon large. Meanwhile, the main part of my page, as before, this time though up here, shall have font size colon medium. And then last but not least is the page's footer, which as before will have a font size colon small. And here too, do we still have that same cascading feature whereby body is still apparent? Of those three other tags, and that body shall be text aligned center, but header and main and footer shall each have their own 
respective font size. Now, why these properties in particular? Well, you would only know which properties exist by consulting some documentation or class. But indeed, text align and font size and font family and color and more are all defined by CSS as being available properties. Just as with HTML, whereby you might hereafter look up in some reference the available tags, so in CSS can you do the same to see what properties exist and for. What HTML tags. So if I go now and reload this page, the effect should be visually the same, but I now have at least moved all of my CSS to the top, at least within the head of my page, and all of the HTML or most of it down below. Indeed, here it looks exactly as expected, no different from before, but design wise, underneath the hood, Have I now structured it better? But it turns out you don't have to apply CSS properties only to HTML tags in this way. You can actually create reusable collections of properties that you can apply to this tag or this one or multiple tags altogether. In fact, let's go now to some HTML that's almost the same, but create some new collections of properties quite like those here. And so let me go ahead and say I would like a class or a collection of properties called centered, as Indicated here by that dot. Indeed, in CSS, if you have not just a word but a dot, it says this is a class, a custom name that you yourself provide. And inside of the curly braces now, and am I, am I going to do just as before text align center? But suppose I now want some reusable classes as well that express the notion of small, medium, and large. Well, I could have one called large, inside of which for now is just one simple property like font size equals large. Meanwhile, might I have medium defined almost the same? And lastly, might I again have, say, small, that just as these others do exactly that. So my code is little different, but now I've associated properties not with hard coded tags, but rather with words, class names, so to speak, that I can apply anywhere I want. So as to achieve the same effect as before, but now using these reusable commodity classes, can I go down to my page and say, well, my body shall have a class of quote unquote centered. Meanwhile, my header shall have a class of Quote unquote large. And the main part of my page, meanwhile, will be medium as before. And that footer, lastly, shall be small. So the effect for me, the programmer, is little different. I'm not actually changing all that many keystrokes, but I now have these collections that I can reuse here or in other tags still, particularly if this page were even bigger. If I go ahead and reload the page now after saving that file, voila, it still looks the same because, again, we're focusing now not on correctness. But also design. And so, with CSS, are there best practices, or at least good practices, for this particular context via which we can implement our same ideas but better? But there's still one last opportunity here, I dare say, to do better. Suppose that colleague of mine with whom I'd like to collaborate actually would prefer to work on their own file. After all, I'm still commingling my CSS with HTML. It just happens to be not in those attributes, but in one bigger tag. Up top there. And so, why not just factor all of that CSS out and put it in a separate file and then just tell my HTML file how to find it? And indeed, let's do this with one final flourish. Here in a new file, css3.css, are those same CSS classes inside of which are those properties, but now all of this code is in its own file. Meanwhile, I'll have another file, css3.html, which before had all of my HTML and CSS, but this time here has just one new tag, link. This tag link says to the browser, hey browser, link this file to this other one called css3.css. And the relationship between one file and the other is quite simply that of style sheet. And so effectively, what the browser does here is copy paste the contents of that CSS file as though it were at the top of this page. But the effect ultimately for development purposes is that now I have my so called separation of concerns. And I and any number of colleagues can work now truly independently on these two files, aggregating later the net effect together. Moreover, Because this CSS file is now factored out, I can reuse that same CSS file not just on this page, but dozens or hundreds of others. And so, if indeed you put in one or more files all of your CSS, you can reuse those entire files. And browsers themselves are smart and try to be as efficient as possible. And so, if a browser realizes that while you visit some website, that this page and that both use the same CSS file, 
the browser can be smart and download that file just once, thereby saving you the user time because you don't have to wait for that file to download. And it saves the website bandwidth because it doesn't have to download that same file twice. So, simply by focusing not only on the correctness of the content that you'd like to display and the aesthetics thereof, but on the underlying design, can we build systems that scale better and can be built by so many more people? All right, so with HTML, can we structure our web pages and the data therein? And with CSS, can we take things that final mile and stylize it just the way that we want? But everything we've coded thus far has been static. I write it, I save it, and, and then everyone else reads it. But of course, so many of today's websites are dynamic. They take users' input and they produce, per every user, disparate output. So, how can you do that? Well, you need for that to work a proper programming language. And some of that logic that changes the data and changes the pages that users see can be done on the server side with languages like Python. But a lot of it, and increasingly so, can it be done client side on the Mac or PC itself within the user's browser. And the language via which this is done these days is via JavaScript, not to be confused with Java, another language still. But via JavaScript, do you have the ability through writing functions and conditions and loops and Boolean expressions and more to actually change a web page once a user has downloaded it? For the first time in that virtual HTTP envelope. In other words, imagine most any website you visit daily that's constantly changing. For instance, something like Gmail. Anytime you receive a message in Gmail or any web based client, you get, for instance, a new row in a table, each of which represents an email you've gotten. Or on some social media site, might you get messages that just pop up at the bottom of the page and you don't have to wait until you click something or reload in order to see them. And so with JavaScript, what you can do is send to the user some initial HTML, the simplest of web pages that doesn't have all that much content. But because the browser then loads that HTML into memory, into RAM via the DOM or document object model, that tree or more generally, data structure can evolve over time. Just as you can add and remove things from an array or a list, so can a tree have more or fewer nodes and branches. And so, with JavaScript, a proper programming language, can you add data to a web page by just asking via HTTP some server for that data anytime a new email comes in, and then present it to the user really by just adding another TR? Or table row to a table, or another div, or another element still. And so with JavaScript, too, we have the ability then to change web pages and most importantly, listen for users' input. For instance, here is a list, but not even an exhaustive list, of all of the events that might happen while a human is interacting with your website. They might click or drag or change something on the page, each of which is an operation or more generally, event. That the author of that web page can listen for by writing code in JavaScript. For instance, if you've ever used Google Maps or some other mapping tool where you can click and drag in order to see north, south, west, or east, every time you click and drag, you're seeing more images, more tiles, so to speak. And if your connection happens to be somewhat slow, you might actually see gray placeholders until all of a sudden new squares. Suddenly appear. That's because behind the scenes is the browser requesting more and more images from some server and then embedding them in the website dynamically, adding more divs or some other HTML elements. Moreover, if you have Gmail, that again is just getting more and more data from the server and appending it or prepending it to some HTML table or some stack of big divs. So there's any number of events that we can listen for, and those events at what underlie. Every possible interaction you have with a modern website. It's just a menu of things a programmer can listen for, and can you listen for those things with JavaScript? For instance, suppose I want to make my very first interactive web page that has an HTML form, but this interactive form doesn't go to a server like Google's, but instead stays right here and interacts with the user. Well, I might have a form tag inside of which are a couple of inputs, so let's go ahead and construct this UI and then somehow write some code in JavaScript that listens for. 
clicks of the button, submissions of this form, intercepts that submission, and then does something with the user's input. Here, then, I have a file hello.html, inside of which I'll go about implementing my form. In here, have I opened and closed my form tag, and now I need the first of my inputs. I'm going to go ahead and say the type of this input is text, but you know what? As before, I'd like to turn autocomplete equals off and autofocus for UI's sake. And moreover, I'm going to go ahead and have an input type equals submit, the value of which quite simply will be submit. Finally, for UI's sake, let's go ahead and add a placeholder of quote unquote name so that the user knows exactly what it is we want of them. Now, I'm not going to include, say, the action attribute on my form elements here this time because I don't want the action to go to some server. Rather, I do want to keep the user right here. So, you know what? Instead of that default action via which the browser handles submission, I'm going to go ahead and say the following. On submit, literally telling the browser when this form is submitted, do this and not your default behavior. Inside of quotes, I'm going to go ahead and type now, not HTML and not CSS, but code in JavaScript. I want to go ahead and say greet the user, and I'm going to go ahead and quite simply say greet. Thereafter, I'm going to go ahead and implement this. Function as those parentheses would imply. Indeed, JavaScript, quite like Python, looks very much the same and has similar conventions. Functions have names and you call them with parentheses and zero more inputs. With JavaScript, we achieve the same but through slightly different syntax. Up here in the head of my page, I'm going to go ahead and now add yet another new tag, this one called script, implying to the browser that, hey, browser, here comes a script or a small program written, as is presumed, in JavaScript. Now, in order to declare my own function in JavaScript, I don't say def as in Python, I instead say function quite literally. And if I want this function to be called greet, I simply say it by name, open paren, close paren, since it shall take no inputs here. And then inside of curly braces, not just indentation with some colon, I'm going to go ahead and say window.alert, quote unquote, hello, comma, world. Followed by semicolon. Here too, am I passing a string or a phrase into alert as an input? And notice that alert itself is associated with the window. Well, it turns out in JavaScript you have some global variables, if you will, one of which is called window and refers to data or functionality that's somehow associated with the whole browser's window. Indeed, what I want to do ultimately is have the user type in some input and then display an alert that says, hello world, as in this case. So that's it. I've defined a function called greet. I've hard coded that I want it to alert the user. And I've told the browser on submit to call greet. Unfortunately, there's a couple shortcomings here. Indeed, I seem to be asking via HTML for the user's name and yet never doing anything for it. But that's OK. Let's still break this problem down step by step, getting each milestone right until we build on this success, hopefully. With at least one other. Let's go ahead and save this file here, go back to the browser, and type my name, David, followed by a click on submit. And there it is. This page says, Hello World, an alert of sorts that my browser, here Chrome, has displayed for the user. So, window.alert is a function built into the browser window itself that does exactly this opens a prompt, says a message, and then allows the user to click OK. There's a small bug here, though. Indeed, when I click OK, you'll notice that suddenly the page refreshes entirely, disappearing my name. Well, that's not exactly the behavior I intend, especially if I want the user's input to remain. Moreover, I want to ultimately do something with that input. So, this is a subtle change to make, but it turns out if in JavaScript you want to override the browser's default behavior, inside of this submit, I need to say not one thought, but two. I need to tell the browser via a Boolean expression, return false. This is simply a convention that says whatever your default behavior is when submitting a form, do not do that. Return false. Turn that off. Instead, only call greet, which is going to be this function. This ensures that we don't accidentally not only take the user's input and do something with it, but also send it off somewhere that's not here defined. So now let's actually capture 
the user's name or input and actually print hello so and so instead of just world. Well, to do this, we can solve the problem in several ways. I'm going to go up here in my greet function and declare a variable. The keyword in JavaScript I might use for this is called let, so to speak, let the following variable take on some value. And I'm going to go ahead and call that variable, perhaps reasonably name. And then I need to go about getting that value. From the web page. And here, that same picture we drew of the so called document object model or DOM, that tree allows you to think about where this value is going to come from. Somewhere in my computer's memory is a tree structure, and one of the nodes or rectangles in that tree is this text box. And that text box, once the human interacts with it, has some value. So I somehow, programmatically, in this new language JavaScript, want to express hey, browser, go get me from the document that particular node and go in and get its value and return it to me so that I can store it from right to left into this variable. And the means by which we can do that is this Hey, browser, go into the document, thereby accessing another global variable, so to speak, alongside window, and go ahead and select via a function called query selector, so to speak, whereby I can now specify the name of a tag or some other expression via which I can go get that particular input. Unfortunately, that input. Doesn't yet have a name, or better yet, it doesn't yet have an ID. It turns out in HTML and in turn JavaScript, if you want to proactively give certain elements identifiers unique across the entire document so that later in code you can refer to that input and not mistake it for any other, you can give inputs not only names but IDs simply by saying, for instance, within this tag here, the ID of this tag should actually be quote unquote name, or X or Y or Z or anything else, but here too I'll name it quite aptly. And now within my query selector, I need just a pair of quotes, single or double, and I need to now express that unique identifier's name. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say, Hash name, because it turns out in JavaScript as well as in CSS, you can specify or select a specific tag by way of its ID. And the browser only knows that you mean an ID by way of this hash. You don't write it down here, you only write it here, but the browser realizes, oh, I see a hash, you must mean the element with this ID name. So now, have I selected from the web page's document? That node, that rectangle from my DOM, but I specifically want its value. And the syntax for that, quite simply, is to say dot value, go into that box and grab the text of whatever the user has typed in. So, what now remains? Here I have a line, let name equal the following value, for instance, DAV ID. And then I still have the window alert, hello world, but I now want to say hello to that name, hello David. Well, I clearly want to replace the word world with that name. So, how might I go about doing that? Well, in JavaScript, we have multiple options, but perhaps the simplest is our old friend concatenation, using a plus not between numbers, but between strings or text values, and quite simply concatenate onto the end of that thought hello, hello. Plus name. Now, if I save this file, go back to my web page, and begin to interact with it after loading, I can go about typing my name, and hopefully, with fingers crossed, do I now submit it and see not just hello world, but D A V I D, submit hello David. And there then, with JavaScript, Have we rather come full circle? Not only do we have the ability to present data and the stylization thereof, we also now have the ability to change our minds later and manipulate that page, perhaps even prompting the user interactively with values he or she actually typed in. And so you can perhaps imagine now that we've only just begun to scratch the surface of what you can do in JavaScript, but almost any of today's popular websites with which you yourself interact are being influenced and talked to by this particular language. JavaScript. Well, what more now can we do with JavaScript? Well, we needn't just wait for the user to type something in and then submit some form to our code. We can instead actually change the aesthetics of the website too, just by waiting, say, for mouse clicks on buttons. For instance, in this file here, background.html, let's go about giving ourselves one or more buttons that, if clicked, change the colors of that page. So I'm going to go ahead here and use another tag still called button, but proactively, I'm going to go ahead and give it a unique identifier of quote unquote red, because my goal ultimately. Here is going to be to create a button that, when clicked, changes the whole background 
from white to red. So here, I'm going to go ahead and call this button quite simply R, and I'm going to go ahead and close that button tag next. And now, down below here, am I going to print my script tag? This time, not in the head, but below. Because indeed, logically now, I need this button to exist before this code actually executes. Before, when I created that greet function, it was only eventually called, not right when the page loads. So here now, I want this script, though, to run after the buttons have been rendered. So, what do I want to do within this, this script or mini program written here in JavaScript? Well, I think I'd like to express the following. First, let's go ahead and say to the document, go ahead and select via that same function, query selector, this particular button whose ID is red. I can express the notion of an ID again with that hash and then the word of that ID red. And when I select that button, I want to go ahead and listen for an on click event, not on submit per se, but on click, because this time I want to distinguish one among multiple buttons. And here, what do I want to do when that button is clicked? Well, I'd like to execute a, a block of code. Well, what is a block of code? Well, that's really just what a function is. And in fact, functions don't always have to have names. Sometimes you just want a function to encapsulate one or more lines. And in JavaScript, this is actually quite straightforward, if cryptic, certainly, the first time around. I can just say, hey, JavaScript, give me a function with no name. Just parentheses implying that it also takes no input. And then by convention this time, I'll put a curly brace on the same line just because I want the other curly brace down below. And I'll finish my thought in advance with that semicolon. This is to say now that between those two curly braces is a function. If an anonymous function with no name, that is just to have one or more lines of code that I'd like the browser to execute if and only if that red button is clicked. Now, what do I want to do when that button is clicked? I'd like to change the whole background of the page, that is, the body, from white, its default, to, in this case, red. So let's go ahead and ask the browser again hey, browser, go into the document and select via that function again, query selector, not red or any ID, but rather an actual tag, quote unquote, body, with no hash because body is the name of that tag. And I'd like to change the, the style. Of that particular tag and everything therein. And so it turns out that I can get not its value as before, but instead its, its style, its actual CSS. And within that style property, so to speak, is there something called background color? Capitalized this time exactly like this in so called camel case, whereby it's a lowercase background and then a capital C and the rest of the word color. This is distinct and unfortunately inconsistent. With what this would be called in CSS. Were I writing CSS and not JavaScript, I would actually say background dash color, all in lowercase, just as font size and text align are all lowercase with that same dash. But so be it. These languages were designed by different people, and so sometimes you simply have these inconsistencies. Now, style.background color is indeed the current color, which is to say white. So if I want to change that color, I just need to assign it a new value from right to left. And frankly, I'll just change it to that quote unquote red, followed by a semicolon, thereby ending my thought. And while each individual keyword on the screen here might in itself look fairly cryptic, again, consider it top down. Hey, browser, give me a button, the label of which is just R, and the unique ID. Underneath the hood of which is just red. Hey, browser, here comes a script, a program written in JavaScript. Hey, browser, from the document, select the element whose unique ID is red. And on clicking that button, that is to say, listen for the following event and then call this function that has no name, but that's fine, in between these two curly braces. Document.query selector, quote unquote body, dot style, dot background color equals red. So if I now save this file and open that page, I should see a button quite simply labeled R. And if now I click this R, I should see that my white background becomes indeed red. Now, red's not all that interesting, and this page is far from all that interactive because now it's red and it's permanently so. I've not implemented any notion of a, a toggle, which I could, perhaps with an if else. Now it's just red. But what if I wanted to allow at least three colors, R, G, and B? For red, green, and blue. Well, with a bit of duplication or better design, could I do this? And let me actually pull something out of the oven that's already written here, which is to say, this version, voila, 
now I have that same structure, red, green, and blue, as well as a few blocks of code. But because this is getting fairly verbose, I've actually factored out some of my code to another variable. Document.query selector, quote unquote, body is what I would need to use three times now, one for each button. But I've instead called that just once, stored the answer. In body, the equivalent of really going into that tree and plucking out one of those nodes, one of those rectangles from the DOM, and just calling it body so that I have now immediate access. And thereafter, I simply check for red on click and green on click and blue on click, and on each line, setting that background color. And I could actually take this further because indeed there's clearly a structure here. So while correct, this is not necessarily. Well designed. Indeed, almost all of my code is now the same, all of that red, that green, and that blue. And so there's certainly an opportunity here to factor more out and maybe use a loop. Listen for red and then for green and then for blue. And so do something again and again, specifically three times. But for now, we'll leave this as demonstrative, really, of what you can do in the intersection now of not just HTML and JavaScript, but HTML and CSS. And JavaScript, because indeed that's what's going on. By way of this style property inside of the body tag, can I change something just as I can read it? In the past, did I read the value of what the human typed in? But here I can check the style of the body and even change it. Allow me now to pull one more cake out of the oven. This one called size.html. Here again, I have a, a paragraph of Latin or Latin text, which is fairly small by default. But I've used that familiar UI mechanism, a, a drop down or select menu, inside of which is multiple values. By default, its value is quote unquote initial. But here we see that we can go large or small, or even XX large or XX small. In fact, we can interact now with this web page using HTML that's being Listen to by JavaScript so that if I go ahead now and select, say, XX large, a well defined type size in CSS, I can go ahead and magically change the entire text to suddenly be extra, extra large. Meanwhile, if I go to that same drop down menu and choose instead XX small, it instead goes in the other direction. So, how now might this be implemented? Well, it's probably quite non obvious exactly what code to write. But the primitives are exactly the same. There is some drop down menu implemented with some HTML that we've not actually yet seen, but there's clearly an action or event associated on occasion with that HTML element. It happens to be an event called unchange. Whenever that Drop down menu's value changes, you, the programmer, can do something. And what can you do? Well, technically anything, but in this case, I want to change the font size. And just as I can change the color of a background of an HTML tag, thereby affecting with JavaScript its underlying CSS, so I bet can I do the same here using JavaScript to change the font size property. Of one or more HTML elements. And while, again, the wiring of this in code might not be so clear, all of this interaction reduces to these first principles. What can you do? Well, HTML tags lay out your data, CSS styles the page, and with JavaScript, can you listen for interactions from a user and respond to those actions or events? With some change. So, indeed, here, let's look underneath the hood, so to speak, at this file here, size. HTML. I have my paragraph of text up top here in my P tag, and below that, a new tag, so called select. This select tag is what gives you a drop down menu on most any website, and you can see within that are any number of options. Those options happen to have specific values, and then between the open and close tags, you have whatever the human sees. So you could have, just with, as with links, dichotomy between the values. That are ultimately used and what the human actually sees. But in this case, surely I'd like to be consistent, and so I've made them quite the same. By default, though, I had initial selected, and that's because I indeed had this attribute with no value, quote unquote, selected on only one and just one of those elements. Now, if I go down below, I'll see another script tag. Again, here I've put it down below so that everything has been read already by the browser, top to bottom. And here I have now. Our old friend, Query Selector. Hey, browser, go into the document and select via Query Selector the tag called conveniently select. And on change, 
when its value changes by way of some interaction, go ahead and call the following function. As before, that function has no name. It's just a, a block of code, one line in this case. And hey, browser, go into the document and select the body just as before. Go into its style and change whatever its font size is to. This dot value. Now, this, this placeholder called this is actually a variable to which we have implicit access. Because this code is associated with that select menu, conveniently in JavaScript, this means whatever element is an actual play here. Now, notice that same inconsistency again. Font size has this camel case, capital S. There again, turns out that JavaScript standardized on and only supports this approach because in JavaScript, it turns out if you had a hyphen, it would be confused for subtraction, which is not what we want. So, font size in JavaScript max, maps to font dash size, all lowercase in CSS. And so, the net effect here is to say, hey, browser, change the font size of the body to this value. Value, which is whatever the user selected. And now, one final flourish an example that uses JavaScript to actually find my or perhaps your location. Indeed, it turns out now browsers today, and in turn computers and laptops, can figure out where you are with high probability. This is all thanks to GPS in our phones and all of these wireless access points throughout our world. But indeed, this can be useful, if not a bit invasive. But let's see through JavaScript how, with just a few lines of code, you can achieve this yourself. Here then is a web page, geolocation.html, finding someone's location geographically. Via code. Here in my body, I have a, a script tag that fairly arcanely says, Hey, browser, go into your navigator, a historical term, and geolocation is a feature therein, and get the user's current position. That might actually take some number of milliseconds or seconds. And so this says, Hey, browser, please call this function. When you are done. And what is that function? Well, it's one that takes an argument, the user's actual position, and then as per these curly braces, do the following thing document.write, that is print to the screen, the position.coordinates.latitude, comma, position.coordinates.longitude. In other words, if the browser is successful in finding me in this world, I will see quite simply on the screen latitude, comma, longitude. Well, let's go ahead and open this page in my browser. And thankfully, my browser first asks, is this OK? This page wants to know your location, at which point I can either block that invasive request. Or allow it. Now, for pedagogical purposes, we'll proceed to allow, and some number of seconds later, after some deep thought and triangulation, there is where I apparently am in this world 42, negative 71, with quite a few decimal points of precision. Where, in fact, is that? Well, let me go ahead and just copy this now into a, the familiar Google Maps. It turns out with Google Maps, you can search not only by address or city or state, but also by GPS coordinates. And indeed, if I paste those in and hit enter, we'll zoom in on what appears to be, yes, Harvard Law School. And in fact, if we turn on now satellite mode, we can see with some probability exactly where we are. And indeed, it would seem that. I'm standing on the steps of Langdell Hall, the library here on Harvard Law School's campus, which isn't quite right, but those are the steps that I happen to go in to get here. And so your location is only precise within some. Radius of some sort. Why? Well, at some point I entered a building where thankfully Google doesn't have eyes. And so only with some probability can Google or any service identify your precise location. But surely in time will this. Only get better. And so imagine now if you just pull up Google Maps regularly, you might have said allow quite some time ago or perhaps block, but this is how Google Maps knows when you pull it out of your pocket or open your laptop where, with some probability, you actually are. In the, at the end of the day, anyone can ask that same question where is this user in the world? And our only defense right now. Is that block? And if you're in the habit all too often, as frankly am I, of just saying allow or allow, well, you're giving up quite a bit of information because what the program or website does with that information now is entirely up to it. It might be used for good and to show me on a map, or it could be log server side. Once you have the ability to program, can you do anything with this data?
That then is web development, or really only scratching the surface thereof. With HTML, have we the ability now to structure web pages and all of the contents therein? With CSS, do we have the ability to refine the presentation thereof and the size and the color and more? And with JavaScript, do we have the ability ultimately to interact with the user and then do something with that user's input, pass it off to a server or keep it locally, and even change the DOM or the underlying code that composes that web page? On the fly as we get more and more input and more and more data. Of course, all of this now is happening, so to speak, client side within the Mac or PC in the specific browser. If we now go back to the server instead, do we have even more expressive capabilities? Because on servers, can we use, say, Python or Ruby or PHP or Java? And can we store any volume of data in so called databases? And so, whereas web development here has been client side, the whole ecosystem of web development and more generally web programming has yet more pieces that we can assemble as part of this whole technology stack.